can faith and reason work together? Are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play in the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and today we're talking about Islam. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? And I want to remind you that there are many resources just like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. Transcripts and recordings of Dr. Craig's debates on college campuses around the world. Articles, questions and answers, a discussion forum, and much more. Available now at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, we've talked about some of the political clashes among Westerners and Islam. We've been also concentrating on very crucial theological differences that just cause walls to often come up in dialogue between Christians and Muslims. A couple of those things are really prominent. One is the nature of God and uh, the Trinity, and the other is who Jesus is, Mm -hmm. his divinity. With respect to the nature of God, the most fundamental issue would be the difference between Unitarianism and Trinitarianism. Islam is a form of Unitarianism. It says there is one person that God is. On Christianity, by contrast, we believe that there are three persons that God is. In addition to that, there are certain attributes of God, I think, that are quite different in Islam and Christianity. For example, in Christianity, God is conceived to be all-loving and morally perfect, whereas in Islam, God is not all-loving. He only loves Muslims, those who are submitted to him. So with respect to God, there's both differences with regard to Unitarianism versus Trinitarianism, as well as with regard to some of his attributes. It's very offensive for our Muslim friends to consider God as being in some way triune. So let's discuss the Trinity for just a moment. How is God only one God, but there are three persons who are the one God? Well, as I understand the Trinity, we want to say that there are three centers of self-consciousness in God. And by that, I mean there are three persons who can say, I think that. Uh, Just as in my being, there is one center of self-consciousness that I call I, me, myself. In God, there are three centers of self-consciousness, and we call them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because of the different roles that they play in the plan of salvation. It is the Father who sends the Son to be incarnate. It is the Holy Spirit who, in the church age, ministers in the place of the Son and equips the church and empowers her for Christian life and work. So they have different roles in the economy of salvation. And so there, this is sometimes called the economic trinity, which would be the different roles played by these three persons in the plan of salvation. But in terms of the trinity itself, these are three co-equal persons who are all omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, have all of the superlative attributes of God and therefore are God. So there are three persons who are the one God, Mm -hmm. and because something isn't easy to understand, does that uh, make it false? (laughs) Not at all. That's a loaded question, I know. Sure, of course. uh, You'd have to demonstrate some sort of logical incoherence in the doctrine of the Trinity, but I don't think there is any such logical incoherence. The doctrine of the Trinity is not the incoherent doctrine that three gods are somehow one God or that three persons are somehow one person. Rather, it is that there are three persons in the one God. And that's not contradictory. No, that's not in any way contradictory. And when you understand that what the Quran rejects is not that doctrine of the Trinity, but a caricature of it, namely that the Trinity is composed of God the Father, Mary, the mother of God, and their offspring, Jesus— then I don't see that the Muslim really has any substantive objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not as though we're placing something on God's level that is not God, which would be sacrilege or blasphemy to associate something that is not God with God himself. We're not doing that. We're saying, rather, within the Godhead itself, there is a plurality. There are three centers of self-consciousness in God. The skeptic will often try to attack the Genesis are the origin of the doctrine of the Trinity and saying, oh, come on, somebody came up with that at some council Mm. or something. How did we discover or determine the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity? 
Well, I did a master's degree in uh, church history and the history of Christian thought, and I can say pretty confidently that that skeptical representation is just ignorance of church history. What the Council of Nicaea did was simply to ratify what the church had believed right from New Testament times, namely that Jesus Christ is God. He is equal to the Father. And you find that in the New Testament itself. Not only are the attributes of deity predicated of Jesus in the New Testament, and not only is Jesus called Lord, which translates the Greek word for Yahweh, the name of God in the Old Testament, but in certain places in the New Testament, Jesus is actually explicitly called God. For example, in uh, John chapter 20, where Thomas falls at Jesus' feet and says, my Lord and my God. And there are other confessions like that as well. So right from the New Testament, Jesus is called God and thought to be co-equal with the Father. And it was only when certain persons began to deny this doctrine that the church rose up and said, we need to make an official declaration that these people are heretics, that this is in fact incompatible with Christianity, And that's why then the Council of Nicaea formulated and and ratified the Nicene Creed so as to make very clear that anyone who denied this doctrine was denying fundamental Christian truth. So we're not dependent upon later councils or formulations. We can go right to the New Testament and find there, I think, the affirmation of the deity of Christ. Now, when we get to the deity of Christ, this is also very offensive to our Muslim friends because they believe that that is the blasphemy of shirk? Yes, to associate something with God. And again, I I would say that would only be that if you thought Jesus was merely human. But of course, that's not the Christian doctrine. The view of Jesus is that he is God incarnate, that is to say God in the flesh, and that therefore Christ is truly God as well as truly human. That is the affirmation of the Nicene Creed, that He is both. He is truly God and truly man. We have a big fancy term for that, the hypostatic union. Yes, I think it's it's a good term. The idea of a hypostasis in Greek, that literally means, hypo means under, like in a, say, for example, a hypodermic needle. Hyperdermic means under the skin. Dermic, like dermatology, that's the skin. So hypodermic is under the skin. Uh, And so this means under, and then stasis is the Greek word for stand. So a hypostasis is something that stands under. It is the Greek equivalent, really, of the Latin word substance. A substance is sub, under, stance, stand. So a hypostasis or a substance is something that stands under and bears properties. It is a property bearer. And so when we say that in Christ there are two natures in one substance, what we mean is there is one property bearer who has both divine properties and human properties. He has all the properties that go to make up a divine nature, and he has all the properties that go to make up a human nature. And so this hypostasis or or individual, is a property bearer that has a a divine and a human nature and is therefore truly human and truly divine. So the idea of the hypostatic union is that these two are united in one person. Two natures in In one one person. person. Right. A rational hypostasis is a person. A hypostasis is, in a sense, an individual, a property bearer. A rational hypostasis is what we would call a person. When I hear dialogues between Muslims and Christians, the issue comes up of the divinity of Christ quite often. If he were God, then who was he praying to in the garden? Who was he crying out to from the cross, which we'll get into here in just a moment? Mm -hmm. And uh, why did he not know all things and so forth? Yes. It's been said that doing Muslim evangelism is a crash course in Christian doctrine. And I think that's quite right. Muslims don't understand the doctrine of the two natures of Christ. So they think that in proving that Christ had these human attributes like limited knowledge, praying to God the Father, growing in moral perfection, being weak and physically exhausted, even being limited in time and space, 
Christians agree with all of those because we think Jesus was truly human. He had a truly human nature. That doesn't prove that he didn't also have a truly divine nature in addition to that. So the Christian is unmoved by all of these proof texts that the Muslim brings from the Gospels to show that Jesus was limited and human in all these ways because we recognize that. What the Muslim doesn't understand is that we believe Christ had two natures, so that in addition to these human properties, he also had properties like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and so forth. Paul seems to shed some real light on this the second chapter of his letter to the Philippians. When he talks about that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not grasp after that equality with God, but, but became a servant and mm-hmm. became obedient. It's like he limited his rights as God, perhaps allowed them to be, what, veiled? I think that would be fair. What we don't want to say is that he gave up his divine attributes, because if he gave up his essential divine properties, he would cease to be God, and that would not be the doctrine of the Incarnation, which is that Jesus is simultaneously God and man, not that he was first God and then became man and then became God again, so that he was sequentially God and man. The the doctrine of the Incarnation is that Jesus is simultaneously God and man. But certainly in this state of emptying that Paul talks about, this state of humiliation, Christ didn't draw upon and display all of his divine attributes openly. So, as you say, he was ignorant of certain facts like the date of the second coming. Now, I think he actually knew those insofar as he was divine, but insofar as he had a human uh, conscious life, Um, he didn't have that knowledge uh, at his disposal. This was, as you say, veiled or restrained in some way. It would be incoherent to say that Jesus somehow emptied himself of divinity because God is not something that can be emptied. Well, that's right. It would be like saying that God could cease to exist, which is logically impossible because God is a necessary and eternal being. So it's logically impossible for God to cease to be God And therefore, the the notion that Jesus somehow gave up his divinity when he became man is really, it's a pagan idea, frankly, Kevin. It's similar to Zeus in Greco-Roman mythology turning himself into a swan or turning himself into a bull uh, for a temporary period of time. That kind of metamorphosis is really a pagan idea that is completely foreign to the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation. We need to chase the Incarnation here for just a moment. Awesome, wonderful doctrine of the Bible, Incarnation. Let's spell some of the things out there for it, Bill, because uh, often we find ourselves talking about what it, it is not, uh-huh. as, a, as well as what yes. it is. Right. I think that the proper way to think of the Incarnation is not as some kind of subtraction, It's not as though the second person of the Trinity subtracted or gave up some of his attributes and turned himself into a human being. That is a completely foreign idea to Christianity. The way to think of the Incarnation is as a matter of addition, that in addition to the divine nature that he already had, the second person of the Trinity took on a human nature as well, So that now instead of one nature, which was divine, he had two natures, one of which was divine that he's had from eternity, and a human nature which he assumed at the moment of the virginal conception in Mary's womb. So not the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. humanity. Right. Did you come up with that, Bill? Mm, I don't think so. (laughs) I think that's just good orthodox doctrine. (laughs) Okay. See, the incarnation wasn't like uh, a possession. God possessed a human, it seems to go beyond that. Yeah, that's a very uh, with, good with point. Humanity. Right. In in the doctrine of, say, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we believe that God lives within Christians, that he indwells us. Or in demon possession, we think of a spiritual being that's taken control of the body of some other person. But the union of Christ with his human nature is much more intimate than that. It's not a mere as you say, possession or indwelling of God in the man, Jesus of Nazareth. No, we want to say that the person who was Jesus, that person had two natures, one a human nature and one a divine nature. So you have a divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. Even after the resurrection and his ascension, 
as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now, and when we see him one day uh, at his second coming and so on, is he still going to be that God-man? Is he still going to be that incarnation, that uh, two natures? Yes, that's one of the intriguing things about Christianity, and, and I think the doctrine of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ show that the possession of a human nature was not merely a temporary thing that the second person of the Trinity did for 30 years in order to secure our salvation and then gave up. Rather, the resurrection and ascension of Christ show that the incarnation is a permanent state of the second person of the Trinity, and it is an affirmation, I think, of human being, of the worth of human being, and of the worth of the material world as well, that the second person of the Trinity should take on this sort of a material existence and take it on into eternity forever. So when Jesus prayed to the Father and he obeyed the Father and he listened to the Father and so on, he's doing that as a man. That's right. We see in the Gospels the humanity of Christ on display. And it's only occasionally that glimpses of his divinity will come through. For example, in the Transfiguration or in moments of clairvoyant knowledge or perhaps miracles But for the most part, you see the man, Jesus, walking about Palestine, teaching people to obey God, the Father, praying to God himself, suffering, dying. It's the humanity of Jesus that tends to be on display there in the Gospels. How do Muslims view the crucifixion of Christ? This is one of the, I think, most tremendous ironies of Islam, that of all the facts about Jesus to deny— They pick the one fact which is the most indisputable fact about Jesus of Nazareth that is acknowledged by every historical scholar today, namely his crucifixion. According to the Quran, Jesus uh, was not crucified. This was a lie. It says that it only seemed to the Jews that they had crucified him. And later Muslim tradition interpreted this to mean that somebody else was made to look like Jesus and was crucified in his place. And uh, some Muslim tradition says it was Judas uh, Iscariot, that God had somehow changed his appearance so that he looked like Jesus. And he was crucified in the place of Jesus, and Jesus was assumed into heaven Uh, so that he was never crucified. So Islam wants to spare Jesus the humiliation and the suffering and the death of the crucifixion. It denies the passion of the Christ, in effect. And as I say, it's ironic that it should do that, because this is the one fact about Jesus of Nazareth that everybody who studies Jesus acknowledges. So the crucifixion and the resurrection are just out the window when it comes to Islam. That's right. Obviously, if Jesus didn't die on the cross, then he wasn't raised from the dead either. So they deny the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, which, of course, are central to Christian belief. I think you begin to see how different Islam is from Christianity because that means there's no atonement for sin. There's no substitutionary death on our behalf. There's no resurrection of Christ to vindicate his atoning sacrifice. So this means the doctrine of salvation in Islam and Christianity is completely different because Christ doesn't give his life for us as a sacrificial offering to God because they deny the fact of the crucifixion. In wrapping up today, Bill, it appears a good response to our Muslim friends, not only to be loving, but also a defense of the resurrection of Jesus might go a long way. Yes, I think that when we focus on the resurrection, you're not only at the heart of the gospel, but you're also on very solid historical ground. Because, as I say, the vast, vast majority of New Testament scholars, not evangelicals, not conservatives, but the the mainstream of New Testament scholarship, agrees that Jesus of Nazareth was executed by Roman authority, by crucifixion around Passover time, that thereafter he was given an honorable burial in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, that thereafter his tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers, that various groups and individuals then experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead, and that the earliest disciples, despite every predisposition to the contrary, came to believe suddenly and sincerely that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And those facts, I think, go to undergird the belief that Jesus died and was raised by God from the dead, and therefore 
Christianity is true and Islam is, in fact, false. Our question of the day, Dr. Craig, if God knows what we need before we pray, well, then why pray? So that we'll get what we need, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the idea. He knows what you need before you ask him, but you got to ask him. And therefore, prayer, I think, uh, moves the hands of God. God will do things in answer to prayer that he would not have done had we not prayed. Now, that doesn't mean that we change God's mind, and maybe that's what's behind the question here. Prayer doesn't change God's mind because he knows what you need before you ask him, and he knows that you will pray. But prayer has an effect in the sense that were we not to pray, then God would not have moved in the way that he will. Seems like we participate with God in in prayer. It's a way for him to allow us to participate with him in some way. Oh, very much so. It really means that we cooperate with God in bringing about certain events and effects in the world. I can't see God changing his mind. There are some biblical descriptions that seem to indicate that he changed his mind. How are we to understand those? Well, I think they need to be read in the broader context where the scriptures say that God knows the end from the beginning. He He knows uh, uh, the words that I'm going to speak even before they're on my tongue. Uh, he prophesies the future. Uh, and, and in these accounts, I think we need to understand that the Bible is largely a storybook. It's a story of narratives. And these narratives are told from the human point of view and therefore have all the color and vivacity of the storyteller's art. And so they'll portray God as repenting on something or as asking questions like, I'm going to go down to Sodom and see if the report that I have heard is really true. Well, that, that's just a, a kind of human storyteller's approach to God that isn't meant to be theologically picked apart and and criticized. Are they just literary tools to tell the narrative? Yeah, I I think that's right. It's just a way of telling a a colorful and lively story about man's interaction with God, and it's told from the human point of view. That's all. For more resources like these from Dr. William Lane Craig, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. And thanks for listening to Reasonable Faith with William Lane Craig.